Hi, uh, this presentation is Advanced Web Forms. I'm um, going to start off with a, just an introduction to myself. And I want to get the slides fixed correctly. Okay. Right, good. Uh, my name is Jake Rockwitz. Uh, I'm known as Jay Rockwitz on the web. I am a Drupal developer and software architect, and I built and maintain the Web Form modules for Drupal 8. So I just added this slide today because I need to give some context for this presentation. Um, there's a lot of resources online about the basics of the web form module. I've done two presentations at previous DrupalCons. They're all recorded and available. And they're good starting points. And I'm hoping that people have installed the module and have a, oh, yep, um, that people have a basic understanding. And I'm really after trying to produce an advanced presentation that should teach you a few new things and just inspire you to learn more. Some things will go over your head. That's fine. I like that at presentations because then I take something home with me and I have to look it up and learn a little bit more about it. And so building advanced web forms you know, requires leveraging hooks, understanding plugins, building render arrays, and writing tests. And I am going to start with the web form basics to kind of give us some groundwork to work from. And you know, the web form module is a powerful and flexible open source form, build, form builder and submission manager for Drupal 8. And it provides all the features expected from an enterprise proprietary form builder combined with the flexibility and openness of Drupal. And this presentation is really focusing on the flexibility and openness of Drupal. How do you extend this and get the most out of it? And the use case for the web form module is that you build a form or copy a template, publish that form as a page, node, or block, collect some submissions, send out some emails, confirmations, review those results, distribute those results as a CSV, or remote post them to a third party service. And it's really these three things, build, collect, distribute. And I'm gonna do a very quick kind of kitchen sink demo of the web form module and walk through all these different steps of it. Um, to start off, it's clean install. I'm gonna do, I like using the contact form as a starting point. And what I like doing is just showing you like adding, a, it's a simple contact form. I hope everyone's familiar with contact forms, four fields. I just wanna add a, your company element to it and click Add Element, select a text field. Let's see, company. I'm gonna actually collapse all the features because we're really focusing on just building a simple form, collapse. Hit Save. Show you the element added. And there's a mistake here, it should say your company be required and moved up to the top. And I wanna show another part of the web form module where you can edit the source code behind a form. So I can go down here. Take your company, move it up, change the label or title in this case, your company, and you can cut, cut and paste properties from other elements. Hit save. And now instead of going to the view tab, I'm going to go to the test tab, which will give us a preview of the form, but it will automatically fill the form out with some just defaults to work from. And I'm going to generate one submission. And you can see the company fields added up there. Done. And we've just built a form and collected some data. And now we're gonna switch over to just looking at that data coming in. Over in the results tab, there's one record. You can click through, preview that result. You can edit it here. You can add some notes. And then to follow up with the download, you can click over to the download tab, and I can even show you that quickly. See, I like doing an HTML table because I can show it on screen by just saying don't download this and hit download and just renders this HTML table, which would open up in Excel. Um, it's all your data and you can you know, customize it. Um, the only other thing is this contact form did send out emails. I just want to quickly kind of point out where that comes from. In the settings, there's a lot of settings. That's worth going online and kind of looking through all the features. But specifically about the emails, I just want to go over the handler settings. And it just shows you the two, the confirmation and notification email that goes out. And we could look at it and get a preview of what the settings are for sending out an email standard stuff to you from CC. I'm going to keep moving forward. Yep, that covers a lot of stuff. Um, back to my little pointer. A lot of resources. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these slides. I try, try want to include them so that if you can, the slides are available on the Bad Camp website, they're in the web form module. You should, there's additional resources to learn more information. I'm going to kind of just breeze over them, but you can get all the videos that I've recorded online. So, I'm doing something different from a lot of presentations where we leave testing to the end. I want to talk about it now because I think it's really important. I don't want to forget it and run out of time. 
And I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I think of testing, this is one of the most important slides. This is what I believe testing is about. Test confirm expectations. All this talk about all this technology is kind of distract from the, the fact that you just want to confirm things work the way you expect and then you use different tools to help you achieve that. And the web form tests confirm rendering. Is the element rendering the proper markup? Processing. Does the input's default value render correctly? Does it come through? And then when someone hits submit, is that data validated? Do the messages display? And then there's a lot of settings. So there's tests for each individual setting and adjustment to the module, to the element specifically. And access controls is just always a problem and always requires automated tests. So every aspect of access control in the webform module has dedicated tests to confirm that things are working as expected. And some testing best practices I've learned along the way is test modules are your friend, especially with web forms. Because web forms are config entities, you can just create a test module and take any web form you want and put into that test module and then run automated tests on that web form. And personally I've learned, it's kind of similar to component driven design, is you want to break things down and write tests for every single element, every single setting that you create in every element. Literally the like text field has a dedicated web form that shows all the variations of text field and I can test it and confirm that it's working. And it's really, when you're doing a lot of testing, try to find your repeatable patterns in your tests. What types of assertions you're making specific to your module. There is, for example, there's a, a post submission function that just helps quickly post a test submission to a web form. Um, for a lot of tests, you have to organize into groups and subdirectories. And, and at the bottom, these are really important things to emphasize. Like, sometimes you can't write automated tests for everything. Um, it's okay to have manual tests. If it's manual tests, if, you, if they're easy to get to and repeat, that can help a lot if someone says there's an issue. And some tests are better than no tests. And I definitely am guilty of this. Like I'll create a new feature and write the most basic test to just confirm that it works. But by having that test in place, if there's a problem, I can go and start building out that test. It just gives a starting point. Um, let's see. And this is important about the web form module when you're looking through the tests, is it's still using a lot of deprecated simple tests and you should really only be writing PHP unit. Um, at some point we'll migrate them over. I'm going to kind of give you an overview of the tests that you would see in the web form module. And a really important thing to say is this demo is using my local dev environment. You're seeing what I work off of um, when I'm maintaining the web form module. I have 217 forms that automatically get installed to test each piece of individual functionality. Um, for this demo, I like to kind of point out confirmation. And I'm going to, uh, that was not nice. Excuse me for a second. Close, we're back. All right. So, what okay. happened? There we go. So this is just an example, like every single type of confirmation, there's all these variations of confirmation messages you can have in the web form module, redirect, open a page, inline, and then there's all these Ajax variations and you can test each one. The one I like to do for this demo is just to be like the, the modal to, and you know, this is a text field just to make sure the form works, but if you hit submit, it opens the confirmation of the modal. And, and the truth is with this test I'm showing you, I don't have an automated test for it because it's JavaScript. I haven't written enough JavaScript tests. But when someone says there's an issue, this gives me the quick way to kind of debug and, and confirm that modals are still working correctly. Um, when you start, now we're going to start looking at a little code. I'm not, I'm trying to keep the code light here, but it's really important to kind of still look through some stuff. In the web form module, we go into source directory. Well, first off, talking about all those test web forms in tests, this is just an example. There's, you can create tests slash modules and then have these test modules config. This is the two, this is 160 of those 217 forms that just get installed quickly and provides me starting points to test things. Then the test framework for the web mod, which is still this is simple test, but we're talking about elements. I, let's talk about the email element. If I open it up, this is an example where I create a little helper where at the top of each one of these tests I say what web form I need to load. So I don't load 217 web forms with each test run. I run this loads the test element email web form. And if you look at this test, it just shows you what I'm kind of getting at is basic rendering checking, 
basic submission, validation, whether it's checking if it's a valid email address. And what this is, is I have some custom, you can do common delimited email addresses, a multiple email addresses, you can insert that in. It just kind of does some validation for that. And then there's also an email confirmation, you know, enter your email, confirm your email. And this test automatically runs. If it fails, I can actually quickly go in here, type email. Just now? Yes. Okay. Kevin's not here. He hates when this happens. It makes him crazy. Because this is what happened last time. It, my, I, I think my machine doesn't like the red button. Um, and please tell me. If it, I'm not looking at it. So, all right. Um, so this is an example form you can go through and test. You know, sorry, I lost my thought. I'm going to move ahead because I think I've covered almost everything. Yep. Um, more resources to get, get familiar with testing. Not going to go through the details of these. Now we're going to start really talking about web forms. And the first thing to talk about is entities. And you know, everything in Drupal 8 is an entity or a plugin. That's kind of my approach to kind of describing things, um, or it should be. And this definition of entities from Drupal.org, you know, it, it's any defined chunk of data in Drupal. This includes things like nodes, users, taxonomy terms, and contrib modules can define custom entities. And the web form module has its own entities. And this, the web form is a config entity. And a web form submission is a content entity. And it's really important to distinguish it between the two. And I'm not, you know, there's other presentations about it, but config entities, web forms, are exportable. So you can get them into a file. And submissions are content entities which go into the database. And we'll talk more about that. And web forms doesn't use field API to build web forms. Submissions use an entity attribute value model. And I'm not even going to read this description because the most important thing about the entity attribute value model is it provides a simple way to store a lot of data. And I'm going to show you kind of the database because I think it illustrates it more than reading that whole description. This is the main table for a web form submission or entities, you know, where it just has the general, you know, the submission ID, the web form ID, created, completed, changed, draft mode, you know, some data being stored. What the entity attribute value model is on the web form submission data, and it's three parts. The first part you're looking at, and I can get my little pointer here, this is the entity. We're describing submission ID and web form ID. There's the relationship that describes where the submission's coming from, the attributes of the data you're storing, which is the name of the element, the property, so we support composites, so an address would have, address would be, you know, you'd have a name, and then maybe the state, city or zip would be a property. And delta is to allow to support multiple values. And finally, you have the raw string value that you're collecting. And all data that you ever submit in the web form module goes into this table. And to get a good understanding of it, it's not hard. Develop module really helps because you can go over and get a peek at all the web form entities. All right, give it a second. Oh, man. Mm. All right. Yeah. I have it recorded, by the way. I'm not too stressed about if this doesn't get recorded right. Um, we're only going to really talk about web form and the web form entity and web form submission, but you can see the other entities. The options entity stores select menu options that are reusable. Um. Oh, to illustrate kind of the difference between a config entity and a content entity, we can go up to web forms. And we can look at a contact form. And there's an export tab. And this gets you the single config. This is a config entity. This is the concept behind it. Your data that describes the entire web form in one file that you can click download at the end. For a submission, when we jump back up to results, click through. There's actually, oh, I would rather do it this way. In the test tab, there's an API tab. This you have to control the web form develop module. And it gives you an idea of the raw data that's going into the database. This is YAML representation of the tables that we were just looking at, and the entity attribute value model in the data. And it gives you kind of the PHP array you would use to submit it. So some more resources. This is important. Discovering the source entity. This concept, the source entity, tracks and creates a relationship to the Drupal entity from which a web form is submitted from. 
And source ID allows a web form to be reused multiple times in your site. Um, the source ID is determined by the route, so if you have a web form attached to a node, it looks at the route and says, this is the node on the route, and tracks that. You can also pass source entities through the query string parameter. So web form nodes use source entities, blocks use source entities, even power routes support source entities. And going back to that table, these, these two columns, the entity type and ID is the source entity. Entity type for node would be node, and the ID would be the ID of the node. And when you start looking through the data, you start seeing that it tracks the submitted to, the source entity of where the web form was submitted to. And what this starts opening up is you can create things like a site feedback form, where if you take a web form and attach it to every page in your site, it tracks feedback on every single page and records it. It says this person was on the front page, on this specific node. You can do an event registration pattern, where an event, you create event nodes and attach a registration form, the same one, to every event, and you would be pulling in individual registrations per event. And an application evaluation system is a little more complex. That's where you literally have an application web form that comes in, and then you attach another web form to that application to kind of record evaluations of that submission. It's good for like a college application. And the demo, I really just want to walk through web form um, notes, and it's pretty simple on this. If we're looking at the, we'll go back to the contact form, and we hit references. There are no references to this web form, but if you click add web form, it's going to create contact us. Let's do contact us. It is creating a node. It automatically passes through the web form, which is the contact form, and it generates another instance of this web form specific to this node, which is node 5. And if I go over to the test tab and hit submit, it's going to create another submission. And what is key here is to look at the results. It's tracking one result for this node specifically. Even though we submitted the web form before, this is just for this node. So you start getting records only here. If we bubble up, we can see that there are two results in total to the contact form. And this is where the submitted to starts kicking in. In, in looking at plugins, because the, the Source Entity plugin is a nice place to start to talk about plugins. So this is totally new since Drupal 7's web form. This is all new code. This is like from scratch. Um, lots of ideas. So, I mean, that, that the, that idea is a mm -hmm. concept. It is, and if, I don't mind, but we have a lot of time, so I don't mind talking about it for one second. It's basically taking what comments does, because yeah. comments track individual, you have a comment to anything, it's tracked all over your site. You can tap comments to anything, and it borrowed from that idea. Entity type and ID is exactly how the comment table is set up. Um, so the source entity is a really simple plugin. I love this plugin because it just helps you understand getting started with plugins. This is the query string one. And it very simply is just looking at query string parameters, which is source entity underscore source underscore entity underscore type to pass the entity type through the URL and then entity source entity ID. And it figures it out and does a little comparison to make sure it's correct. And then it, you can pass in the source entity. And this is really simple. And if I go over to the route parameter, you start seeing similar code where it loops, it looks at the current route and figures out is there an entity associated with this route and it starts tracking on that. And what's more important about this is to look at the interface, and always look at the interface. This is a, I hope you take that away from this presentation. And it just shows you how simple it is, because there's one method defined, get source entity. So you can kind of define your own source entity plugins. Uh, Commerce is, have going to have, is having to do some of this because they have a really complex system. So to figure out which cart someone's in, they're going to need a custom plugin to do it. Moving on. So. To, to really build forms, we have to step back for web forms and look at form API. And you know, web forms are render arrays which contain elements that build value and submit form values using Drupal's form API. So web forms is a complete extension of Drupal's form API. And render arrays are just the basic building blocks of Drupal content. Anything you see on a site is, comes kind of from a render array. You look at the header, it's a render array. You look at a text field, that's a render array. And I will get more into the details of it, but I want to go back to Form API and just be like, so just an element is anything displayed on a page. It's like a generic thing in Drupal. An input is an element that collects data. A uh, composite is a group of elements. This is a concept in core that Webform just went and ran with. Um, composite in core would be checkboxes and radios. It's a group of inputs working together to collect the value. And a form is a collection of elements and inputs. And yeah, this is a form. 
And now we're starting to talk about render arrays. This is a render array. What you're seeing when you're editing the source is a render array in Drupal. And that just happens to be YAML, and this is PHP. So if you go into core and start looking at code, you're gonna see more forms built using PHP render arrays. And I'll break it down, but this, these three things are important. It helps understanding just how everything works in forms of Drupal. It's build, validate, and submit. That's the key concept behind, it's a key concept behind any form. It's, you're gonna build the form, you're gonna validate that data, and then you're gonna submit it. And for core, like for understanding form API, you can just go into the config directory. If you're a developer and just starting out, you can, these are all forms. This is all form API, and literally, I learned form API. The first form I ever looked at was this form. It's the simplest one in config. And you can go look at the render arrays and understand exactly how it works, just collect simple text values. Um, and going back to our friendly devel module, there's a tool to look at every element installed in Drupal. So we were talking about email before, we can do a filter. There's an email from core. We can look at web forms and we can see all the elements and they'll be the web form email elements right here. This helps give you a lay of land of what form API is making available to you. And this is a link to the examples module in Drupal.org. That's another place to get started with almost any aspect of core. They have dedicated form API example modules which give you code to start playing with. And so I'm gonna keep going. So for form elements, a form element is defined using a render array, which is processed by a render element plugin, which creates an input on a form. And now we should really just define what plugins are. Small pieces of functionality that are swappable. And plugins are reusable, standardized, and extendable. That's the key things you want to think about when you're starting to mess with plugins. And form elements are plugins. Uh, form elements extend render array elements. This is kind of how Drupal inherits things. Um, and when you get to elements, the key two things you want to note is properties that define the element, like the max length, begin with a hash symbol, and every element must have a key. And to kind of break down the anatomy of an element, this is the key. You have your label. We're looking at your name. This, we were just looking at this before. And I've just added some custom attributes to it, some background color, custom class, some properties. And we go forward. This is the rendered what we're going to get. And this just shows you the markup that's going to be outputted to the browser. And a nice thing about this demo is it just shows you a lot of defaults get added to your simple render array elements, including you know, defaults like size, max length, um, custom styles. And so for the form element plugin, these are kind of the breakdown. It's like an overview of it where there's some key methods to think about. You have to define the info. What are the properties for the form element? How are values going to work? How are you going to pass in that value? How are you going to process it? How are you going to build that element? And it's kind of the next part. This is now we're getting into the render pipeline. You're building the element. You're going to process that default value, how that's going to be come out. And then finally, you're going to do a pre-render, which is right before it goes out to the browser. And then the last one, which is a really important one when you get to more complex, is validating those custom elements and getting them to work. And some tips uh, on form elements always Copy and extend existing elements. That's the key with a lot of things in Drupal, is look at existing code, copy it, reuse it. If you can extend off of someone else's code, go for it. Um, element value, this is a little nuance in core, is uh, it is the only way to alter a submitted value. Even though it's validating the submission, if you want to manipulate the data coming through, you have to use an element validate callback. Um, the example would be like, in an email confirmation element, you have two inputs that someone's submitting, and they hit submit, and you validate, you compare the two email addresses. In that validation callback, you need to then say, I only want to track one email address, and you merge those two values into one single value. And you just have to sift around through element validate callbacks to understand that a little better. Composites must always include the pound tree attribute. What that does, composites, it's a group of inputs working together, and that pound tree attribute takes that data as it comes in and bundles it into one associative array that you can then manipulate. Okay, so. Doesn't the tree attribute unflatten the submitted forms, submitted values rather? It, it creates a tree of them, an associative array. And, and if you don't include? It flattens it, it just kind of spews it, yeah. So putting it in unflattens. Yes, thank you. You got me going backwards now. <laughs> See that? All right, thanks. Let's see. End of the day, man. 
All right. Get into web form elements. It's kind of crazy we've been talking about form elements, but web form elements are wrappers that enhance Drupal's form elements, and that's why we had to spend so much time talking about it, because web form elements, you have to create a form element, and then web form elements require that corresponding form element. Both the plugins, a web form element and a Drupal form element, have to have the same plugin ID, like text field. And the web form element plugin handles everything related to an element. Every aspect of a web form element, including like rendering, processing, test values, exporting. Get into a little more. And these are just some hints about it. Like, you know, base classes are used heavily to organize web form elements, like a base text class, so that all text fields kind of use the same behaviors. And when I say that, it's like email, URL, phone number, they're all text fields. So they all have very clear similarities. And traits are really useful for grouping related behaviors where it gets tricky where you can't really use inheritance. Um, the clear example in the web form module is entity references because there's all these different variations of entity references like a select menu, radios, check boxes, autocomplete. So you kind of, I, I use traits to get some of the similar behaviors grouped into, it's a bunch of methods that you can reuse. And with form element, the web, man, the web form element plugin methods you know, it defines the default properties, how that element's gonna be prepared with all the custom features. The behaviors are kind of, there's a bunch of methods to help with behaviors, determining whether it has multiple values, the cardinality. And then something that's really important with these plugins is how you're gonna build the HTML that you're gonna send out to someone in your email. And if you're gonna export it, that table I just generated, how do you get those table comps? And finally, WebForm includes a lot of configuration, so you can define custom configuration form custom configuration form for every element. And for this overview, now we're getting into the big patterns. Um, give me a sec. The Webform module adds some reports, Webform plugins, and this is an overview of every element available to the Webform module. This really, if you want to get a lay of the land on what's going on with elements, if you come over here, you can see, you know, a simple address field, it describes the inheritance hierarchy, how it's using, for example, a base composite um, class, all the different aspects of it, whether it could be a root element, container, multiple, multi-line, the info, all the properties that are available. These are generally global properties. There's a lot of properties for a composite. Um, I'm going to actually go to one we've talked about. I'm going to go to email. There's the email element, email confirm. And there's also a test tab, and this kind of reinforces this concept. You want to break things down so you can test each individual aspect of your application. I mean, for web forms, this is like a lesson I've strongly learned. And this gives you just a quick UI to test a single element. And you know, we could do the validation. It shows you this is the basic source, and then this is the render array that's going to go out to Drupal, like basically what's going to be rendered out to someone. Kind of shows you some of the you know allowed tags in the element. But then it gives you the, the configuration form that we've looked at. In the UI, you can go in and tweak it a little, and I'll just kind of illustrate that you, know, you can test all the behaviors here. And hit submit. And it'll show you just the basic markup, and it shows you that we've added some description and help text to it. Ah, the interface. This interface is a little more complex than the other ones. This breaks down every single property method available to an element. And you start, I mean, we're scrolling through it. This is where you have to navigate around. But when you start looking at it, to get default properties, get translatable properties, this gets very heavy. But this is at the high level. I'm going to jump to a text element. And a very basic text. So this is a text field that goes out to the browser. It's just showing you this is what defines a text field. I'm adding some custom web form enhancements to it, like input masking, input hiding, counters, and all that's inherited from the text base, which is a little more complex, but it kind of breaks down your features. Um, let me see if I can. Oh, this is a lot the, to kind of process. So the web form module includes examples of, of elements and composites and, and literally every aspect, there's a lot of examples. And if we go over here, there's an example of an element and it gives you kind of a starting point. And I kind of want to throw out there that it even includes an example web form that illustrates that element. So this is a 
waveform example element. We can actually find it. I think I'm pretty sure it's in Seoul. There it is. It's just illustrating this example element. If we go look at it, it's a basic, it's just rendering out a text field. It just gives you a starting point to kind of build out your own elements if you need your own custom behaviors. In a lot of cases, people aren't, there's a lot of elements in supported. What's more likely to do with custom code is to build out your own composites. And there's an example of a composite element. And I'll jump to that, and you start seeing a lot more going on here. And it just shows you, and I'll show you the composite element. Basically, it's just a first name, last name, date of birth, and gender. It even includes a little you know, conditional logic to enable those elements. And you have sample code here to kind of work off of and understand this functionality. And then it, it includes the, you know, what's great about copying this, it gives you the Drupal form API element and the corresponding web form element plugin definition. So for creating custom web form elements, you need to create a custom module, you need to, you know, extend or copy an existing form element plugin. You build the test web form. I generally build the form element, form API element has to come first, build that out, build a test form. Once you get that working on the form, then you start building out the web form element plugin, which adds the extra features and the UI to it. And then you need to you know, test this integration web forms, make sure it's working, and then write your automated test with it. Now, we're going to switch gears because we've talked about basically building forms. And now we want to talk about processing data, and it comes down to handlers. And web form handlers are plugins used to route submitted data to applications and send email notifications. And yeah, these are web form handlers. Um, the two one, common ones are remote posts, which will take your data. That's including the web form module, where you can take data and post it to a remote server, like uh, Salesforce or MailChimp. And email, which we've talked about. And that, that's what I'm including a screenshot, is just email as a handler. And you know, web form handler plugin over, um, it, the, these plugins just contain methods that act like hooks. Hooks meaning like something that gets it allows you to like capture behaviors that are happening. When a form is submitted or a submission is saved, updated, deleted, you can kind of act on those. And you can react to a submission state. When I talk about state, it just means you can save drafts. That's a certain state. You can then complete a form. You hit complete. You can act when it's completed. And you can even act when it's updated or deleted. And a little thing important to remind everyone about handlers is they support conditional logic. It's just a really nice feature because you can conditionally send out emails based on different input values or even the language of the user. Oh. Right. Sorry. Okay, so to kind of give you the overview and the lay of the land, uh, the handlers. Uh, uh, I feel like it's Dr. Days. Um, Define the configuration of the handler. You can override settings of the web form in your handler, so you can kind of tweak default behaviors. Um, that's typically used if you want to write, like, generate a custom confirmation message on the fly, and you want to kind of alter it. Um, you can alter elements, start getting into hooks. Alter elements, alter forms, act on post-save operations of a submission. Even, you can even act on when different things are happening, like someone adds an element to a form or adds a new handler to a form, your handler can capture that and work with it. Um, the example would be if you were trying to build a remote database with the element creation, if you were dealing with a remote database, your handler could go out and add columns to that remote database. Um, so for handlers, we start getting into the same pattern here because you can go over to the plugins and there's a handlers tab and you can look at all the handlers available. And there's not as much, metadata, this is not nearly as complex as a web form element. And just shows you little nuances. And I mean, one, one important one is you can specify the cardinality of a handler. Um, the example would be like a debug handler only needs to be attached to a web form once, but you might want to support multiple emails. And you can see debug only supports one, and the example only supports one. So if you, depends on your use case. Most of the time it's unlimited. Um, and then you can determine whether your handler requires data to be stored in the database, because you don't have to store web form submissions in your database. You can have handlers take care of that storage or sending the email or posting it. Um, most of them don't really require a database. Sending an email doesn't require data to be written to the database. It takes the data, sends it out. 
Uh, the only one, like scheduled email requires database because you're scheduling an email, so you need a database to do that. Um, with handlers, we can, we're in the plugin directory. Go back up. I think the debug handler is a pretty good starting point because it's really simple. This is just showing data coming through. So all it does is it, when someone submits a form, it renders the data out to the client and shows them what data has been posted. Um, there is, and the interface, once again, is really useful to understand what's going on, what, what's available. And you see like there's a bunch of metadata stuff, like is excluded, is enabled for tracking, but what you're really gonna start extending is this stuff where alter elements, override settings, alter a form, validate a form, submit the form, even get into the confirmation tweaking that. And then you get into just basically, these are entity hooks, submission create, you know, pre-create, post-create, every single possible hook can be encapsulated in this one plugin. Process and confirmation, and then these are the methods to, if someone creates a new element, to track it. With everything I've just showed you, there is an example for that too. If we go over to the modules directory, and go to handler, plugin. It's a very simple example. All this is doing is displaying a message. So you can kind of go and add this handler and say, I want to display this custom message. But what it does do is if you turn on the debugging, is every single method that I just talked about, it displays a debug method, debug message in the browser for you so you can kind of see what's going on and know when these hooks are being executed, like a pre-create, post-create. And then you can start figuring out where you want to put your custom logic in. Okay. Get to the end of this. So, extending web form exporters. Um, the web form exporter plugins are used to download submissions into spreadsheets of other applications. And this is what I demoed before with the download. And if you look at the export formats, those are the exporter plugins. And the, the, the real simple thing is, this is one plugin that you always want to extend an existing web form exporter. Because generally you're going to want to tweak the CSV or make some adjustment to it to extend the CSV exporter. Um, and those all work off, the CSV exporter works off of a delimited web form exporter base. So you can kind of even start there. And something people don't always know is that there is Drush commands available to get exporting, in, you know, automation, where you can have command line exports. Um, and this plugin starts getting simpler and simpler because really for exporting you're talking about the configuration, writing the data, and if you have files associated with it, what are the file naming conventions? And we're really in the same pattern because you can go over to the exporter tab, it's getting simpler and simpler because these are really simple exporters. This table one we were just talking about, there's not much here. Really it's just tracking whether the exporter is enabled or disabled. And if we go look at the plugin, definition. There's not even an example of it because this plugin is so simple that if we go to the, tab, the table exporter, which I used for the demo before, there's a little checkbox to say open this table in Excel, but then you just start seeing these methods which is write a header out and this is really basic HTML being written out and write the submission data out and write the footer and you can go and start manipulating the data. You just extend this plugin you can build out your own custom. You can get really fancy for your clients. I just, like logos and, and things like that. So now we're getting to hooks. Hooks is like, I, I saved it for last because it's the simplest thing to talk about. Um, hooks are, are functions that define or alter behaviors. Similar to what we're talking about with handlers. And handlers, handler plugins and hooks are very similar. Um, the big distinguishing thing is handlers are only applied to a single form. You take this handler, you attach it to the form, it's only acting on that form. Hooks, on the other hand, can be applied to all data coming through web forms. It, you can write a hook to only a, a, you know, alter one web form, but it's important. Hooks is a good way if you need a global behavior added to things. And all, since web forms, everything's an entity, all entity hooks are applicable to web forms. It's the easiest way if you need to add some custom behavior to a submission going in. And, you know, Plugins, and I had to include event subscribers for people kind of coming to Drupal 8, are the new hooks for Drupal 8. People are still using hooks, but plugins and event subscribers are kind of the, the new Drupal 8 way, and probably in Drupal 9 it'll, it'll keep coming, you know, we'll keep moving the hooks into that system. And I, I just want to include a quick example of a, a form alter hook. 
This alter group is really simple. It's just tweaking the submit buttons, the actions at the bottom and making them a little bigger and putting some margin on it. And the next slide really illustrates the same exact code using a slightly different hook. This is the beauty of hooks. This is, this is altering at a form level, like the form's going out. And this hook is altering the actions element, which is where the submit buttons are. And they both do the same thing. It kind of illustrates Drupal. There's like 10 ways to skin a cat. Um, and these are you know, examples of some of the hooks that I've just talked about. Form altering, element altering, options. So if you have select menu options, you can alter them. The entity hooks. Also, every little aspect, like the libraries and the access rules you can alter. This last one down here I want to call out because it's one of the most powerful hooks I've added to the Webform module. So hook, Webform handler, invoke, alter is this hook that allows you, it captures any request going to a handler and allows you to alter it. So the example would be if you want to use a remote post handler and you need some custom logic to massage the data, you can use this hook to capture that and tweak that data any way you want without going in the route of extending a plugin, you know, creating a new plugin or extending it. Um, it's a really powerful hook. And webform.api.php gives you a really good starting point for looking at hooks. They're all documented there. And we're getting to the end. So some additional Webform resources. I have a blog. You can catch me on Drupal.org or on Twitter. And, and for Webform support, you can kind of go to the Drupal Slack channels are great. I'm active on it. Um, if you need general quick things, if you have general questions, Drupal Answers is the way to go. That's like you put it up there, people generally respond. If they don't, you can you know, bother people on Slack and they'll come to it. If you have bugs or issues, use the issue queue. Um, and that is it. Thank you. Um, I'll take any question. It doesn't have to be like super technical. Any questions are good questions. I'm going to repeat it because we don't have the mic. So, yep. Yeah. Uh, I just want to make sure that I understand that if I don't want to store the answers in the Drupal database, I can send them, say, to our customer the answers. Yes. Yeah, absolutely, and I'm just going to show you the setting because I think it's in, what? Oh, how to not store data in Drupal. I want to just, I want to, don't store data in Drupal, how not to do it, because it is a big issue. I deal with it with healthcare a lot. Like, we do not want patient data going into Drupal. So I'm going to just show you the feature because I think it's one of the most important things people need to understand is, so if I go over to build settings, it's right here, disable the saving of submissions. And it even, there's some conditional logic here that you can check, the, I'm checking it off in the contact form. I'm not getting any warnings or errors because I have emails going out. So Webform figures that out and says, okay, I, I think you know what you're doing, your data's good. If you went to a new form and checked that off, you're gonna get a warning that you're gonna lose data. But this does not, I wanna repeat it so clearly, never touches the database. It stores it in the state system and that's it. It just goes out, you take a remote post and push it out. Other, any other questions? Ah, it's the end of the day. <laughs> Thank you. So, oh.